So in terms of, uh, so we are going to look at anxiety disorders in Dekibandhu. So we are going to see uh, what the, um, you know anxiety disorders look like and we will move on to talk about panic and ag agoraphobia because uh, in all anxiety disorders, we have panic. So that is where I thought we will start with that and we will quickly you know, go through the different types of anxiety disorders. But before of all that, let's look at what anxiety is and it's in a graph. So when we are doing performance, anything that we are going to do, so the anxiety is the arousal. When we are too relaxed, very, very low in terms of relaxation, not sufficiently motivated then in terms of our performance. And when anxiety is slightly, you know, arousal is a little bit up there, we are getting there. And when there is peak arousal and performance, so there are, that's the peak arousal and performance. For an example, let's say that people are running and they are running and running and reaching to the goal um, because there's a competition going on. They put a little bit more performance, they look at the runners behind them and they say, all right, if I just do a little bit, then I will be able to um, achieve that. And then becoming too anxious and getting distracted by anxiety symptoms, that is when arousal is high. So you can see that one part, there is a, the, the one arrow is where arousal is just higher and whereas the other part is like performance is higher. Okay, so when people are getting too anxious, getting distracted by anxiety symptoms because anxiety become prominent, um, then later, so anxiety that you can't focus on the task. So when the arousal is absolutely high, it's becoming higher, then we lose, we cannot focus on the task. Does that make sense, this graph? Yeah? So it's, it's about how anxiety is from the too relaxed state to where we are kind of getting into where anxiety is quite high. And we looked at the performance as a, as a result of that. Okay, so let's look at what type of anxiety are there and how psychologists make distinction between different types of anxiety disorder. Each is characteristic by particular type of fear. So when we have generalized anxiety, which is called GAD or worry, so it is worry is very pro, uh, prominent in terms of generalized anxiety disorder. So people with generalized anxiety disorder report excessive worry about non-specific life events such as health, financial uh, issues, work, relationships. The amount of worry is normally out of proportion to the um, actual danger. So people with generalized anxiety, they might be worrying, for example, like, you know, maybe I am having a health issue going on, perhaps I have cancer or something like that. So we have health anxiety as, as standalone anxiety disorder, but with generalized anxiety disorder, they will worry about everything, including health. So finances, they might have lots of money in their bank. Um, they are doing much better than everyone else uh, in terms of finance, but still they will be worrying, I might lose, you know, what if I lose all my money? Um, and whereas the, the worries are becoming quite irrational in that sense, work, um, they might be in top position, uh, doing really, really well, if we look at it, but their worry might be, I might lose my position. I might, uh, you know, anytime anything can happen. And they have particularly, they cannot tolerate uncertainty. So that becomes a huge problem for them. And their worries are characteristics by what if, what if this happens, what if that happens? The amount of worry is again normally, uh, you know, it, it's, if it is normal, that's fine because we all worry, but it is out of proportion. That, that's the problem. In terms of relationship, they might worry. They might have a, usually people with worry, they will have an absolutely loving husband who is very much dedicated to them in, in the relationship, but they will be worrying. What if he has, if he's having an affair? What if he doesn't like me? What if he doesn't like my cooking? So, so all these things, and they cannot say anything, even if they say a little bit, 
the anxiety is uh, you know, out of proportion. They might start to cry. They might have a little bit of an argument with them and saying, are you saying you don't like me anymore? Where the man would have said something else. Maybe they might have said, oh, there was less sugar in this tea or something like that. But it will all blown out of proportion and saying like, you know, you, you don't like my tea anymore. And that means you don't like me. And that means, you know, you like someone else. And that means uh, you are going to leave me. And what if you leave me? I wouldn't have any partner. Then I'll be totally doomed. And so it just goes like that. So health anxiety, people with health anxiety are preoccupied with having a curing a serious illness. The frequency, uh, they frequently seek reassurance about their health, but fail to feel reassured. So they will be coming and especially they have this beautiful relationship with, relationship with, their, with their doctors, GPs, which make things very, very difficult for, for, for the psychologists then. To, to, to kind of um, distinguish what's, what's going on. So usually they will run to their GPs, some people, um, and say like, I have this problem, I have that problem. And, and the GPs also will get engaged in, in diagnosing them, sending them to different tests. Um, and then, you know, they will have a history of that. Uh, and it, it will all come out as nothing and they are fine. Um, so when we started to treat, so if they come to the psychological therapies and services, it's very important, especially, I mean, we need to have established good relationship with the GPs, their doctors, uh, as a psychologist when you are treating. Um, and even if you're both doctor and a psychologist, and you know, if you're a psychiatrist, you're treating, it's very important that you do have that connection with the, with the, with the people who are taking care of their physical health. And having conversations with them, is it okay to kind of pause all these tests? Because if a health anxiety client, if they are not suffering from anything, and we have sufficient kind of results saying that, um, but if they come to the doctors and sometimes they might send them to different various tests. And if it is unnecessary, we say, let's pause. If you're thinking this is anxiety, let's pause all the tests for some period of time um, and then start you know, working with their health anxiety. And by this time, client believes it's health anxiety and they think it is health anxiety, but they cannot manage it. They feel uh, everything is out of proportion and they have to do something about it. And so seeking reassurance could be Googling excessively. And it's not like for like one or two minutes, five minutes, it's for ex excessively for hours and hours and hours. And their half day would have gone just searching for symptoms. And anything they feel in their body, as something, because we have sensations in our body throughout the day. We might feel some tingling in the, uh, in the food. We wouldn't even notice because that's how we are. But with people with health anxiety, they will notice every single thing in terms of what's happening in their body. They have selective attention and they have been scanning their body and they have been become very good at it. So every single time there's a little bit of a sensation, they would say, what's that? Is it cancer? What's that? Is it this? So they will be kind of asking those questions and immediately they will have a panic attack or you know, they will have to kind of seek reassurance. Usually the first person they will go to is their husband's partners, uh, parents and say, do you think I'm suffering from that? And they would, the parents would go, of course not. And uh, then what happens is they will be have feeling good for like five minutes, but then of course that reassurance never lasts and they will feel another sensation and they will go into panic mode again. Okay, so obsessive compulsive disorder, OCD, it's like really, there is a variety of, of things that's going on with OCD. It's a, it's a complicated kind of um, presentation, whereas the other ones can be, can kind of say, this is what it is. But with the OCD, there are different things. But the core in terms of OCD is two core beliefs that comes up, which is I am bad or I am, I have, I am responsible. So it, it like it, it is with um, depression. We have like core beliefs: I am unloved, I am disliked, I am a failure, something like that. Whereas here with OCD, I am bad or I'm responsible. 
And all the beliefs are out. If I do this, then I'm not bad. If I do this, then I am not responsible. So you can imagine they will absolutely taking responsibility for everything. So they will be checking their house for any household, you know, if, if any, anything to do with fire uh, and they, they will have to, they cannot leave home because they will be keep coming back and checking and checking and checking. We talked about creating rules. If I am, you know, pleasing and loving and caring, then I'm not bad. So they will be overdoing, over pleasing in that they are unable to relate to anyone really. The intimacy of relationship will suffer, but it was like overwhelmingly, they will kind of put lots of effort to ensure the other person is absolutely comfortable or something. And they will, you know, do, do everything for that. On the top of it with the uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, so they will be doing lots of checking um, about, it. it could be anything, it could be mental checking, it could be externally checking, excessive washing, because you know what, they want to take responsibility that they are not going to spread the germs to you or anyone else. So they will be spending their whole day washing their hands and it will, you know, get dried and things like that. So, um, so it could be with germs, information checking as well, it could be, you know, checking with the information could it be possible that I made a mistake? So even just one email, they may be checking for like 10 times, 20 times. Um, OCD can be very difficult, kind of, you know, when, when it is really severe. Usually people end up in the hospital and, uh, you know, treatment happens there. Um, so when I'm talking like individually, like GAD, um, health anxiety and OCD, so all of them uh, can, you know, get depressed. There could be comorbidity that could go on with OCD. Uh, another feature of OCD is intrusive thoughts. So like um, with PTSD, we have intrusive thoughts, but it's about what had exactly happened. Something had happened in their past and that will come through their mind. With OCD, they will have intrusive thoughts such as um, that they are going to kill someone, that I'm going to kill someone, or I'm going to have an affair. So they might be married uh, and, um, you know, happily married maybe, but they have these intrusive thoughts coming into the to, through their head against their will. It's not like they are saying like they are sitting and thinking about that, but it's like random thoughts coming into their mind that such as, you know, I am a pedophile, for an example, I'm a psychopath. Uh, and these people, you know, they could come and they would shiver and they would cry and they will fall apart in front of you saying, I think I'm going to harm a child. I think I'm going to kill someone. So our work starts with that. So those intrusive thoughts that you would be maybe, you know, anyone who is pedophile, they are not going to come in front of you and say, I think I'm a pedophile. I think this is happening. What they you would be checking out is you do really need to check out whether they are pedophile or not. So ask them the right questions. So tell me what have you been doing? Have you been looking at a child recently? And they would go, no, no, I can't look at a child. So this is what they are. They, they, they cannot at all look at a child. They will completely avoid children and they will be indoors and close their curtains. So have you, have you been looking at any uh, images of children? No, 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 of course not. And uh, uh, because that's too dangerous for me to look at an image of a child. And then, um, so what else have you been kind of engaging in that could, you know, say that you are a pedophile? Um, and then they will be saying everything exactly just opposite and falling apart from panic and shame and everything. And they would be even thinking of killing themselves because it's too much for them, those thoughts. So then you would kind of distinguish. So tell me how, how so, so let's compare you with the pedophile. How do you think the pedophile will look like? Oh, they will be enjoying looking at a child. They will be enjoying seeing a naked image of a child maybe. Oh, so what about you? No, 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 I'm not that. Okay, then that's how you distinguish for them because when they actually come, you can imagine they don't want to talk about this. They will be sitting with it for a long period of time. When it becomes severe, they cannot manage it. That's when they seek support. So also it could be that they will not be handling knives and things like that. So that's like pedophile kind of intrusive thoughts. Um, uh, and the other intrusive thoughts could be like, they cannot touch or they cannot go near to any sharp objects because they think if they go near to the sharp ob objects, they are going to kill you. 
So sometimes it's about, you know, working with the knives and giving them the knives and see whether you're going to kill me. It's like, it's like taking a risk, isn't it? But make sure that they are not going to kill you first. So ensuring that it is OCD, um, not anything else. So they do, they do have these intrusive thoughts. I'm a psychopath. If you give me a knife, I'm going to just put it there put that into you and it's very difficult for them they will be sitting and crying and crying and crying their eyes out uh, and you can imagine so there are religious preoccupations so they are preoccupied with things um so they could be religious they could be you know anything some some of them would be thinking like you know that I, i'm going to have an affair or something and that would be too much for them these are the people who will not have an affair and they will be sitting and crying and crying that um that that somehow they are going to cheat on their husbands or wives so so that could be the, so those thoughts that um you know sometimes people struggle with working on those things but when it comes to checking behaviorally um it's quite easy and with the ocd um if i could share i have been working with really uh, uh you know people who are in a high top level of jobs like scientists i have worked with scientists researchers uh, surgeons doctors uh, i have been working with the doctors one doctor who thought that um, you know the person thought he or she was a pedophile and they couldn't they couldn't go near to a child and that was so difficult for a doctor to not to go near to a child and do their work so so you can kind of see that um, in terms of occupation and everything, they could be in you know different levels. So uh, what I'm saying is, if, even with health anxiety, you can have lots of medical professionals coming in with health anxiety and generalized anxiety. So um, so it's not like you know lots of people think it's the the poverty and all these things have a play on mental health issues and things like that. But you could you could have variety of people coming in for treatment for that. Panic attacks, panic disorder. Panic is present in all anxiety disorder, really, almost all of them. Um, maybe slightly less with worry, uh, but there are people who, with, with, with the generalized anxiety, but they do have, a, a, some people have panic attacks as well. So as I said, the comorbidity is there because of the fight or flight with all the disorders, that there is a sense of danger, um, they do suffer panic. So people who suffer from panic, experience sudden feelings of terror, doom, which may seem uh, to occur out of the blue. So it can happen out of the blue. Attacks typically fairly short-lived, uh, but can be re-triggered uh, and can last for long periods of time. With panic attack, um, we will talk about it later because I'm going to focus on panic attack. So I'm going to not say too much about that. So let's move on to post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, follows a traumatic event where the individual felt that their life or bodily integrity was in danger or witnessed something similar, as well as ongoing sense of threat that lasts beyond um, end of actual danger. PTSD is accompanied by vivid memories of the event uh, replaying in the person's mind. So with PTSD, you know, you go, so all, with all these uh, disorders, people go through trauma, right? Something had happened in the past, there's a possibility. And we talked about that could be nature versus genesis, could, could be genetics as well. They are prone to that vulnerability, then they, then they went through a trauma and this had happened. So we can say that. Um, with PTSD is then, uh, although you go through some trauma, then, there is a period of time, three months, and if you are not over it, that's when we diagnose with PTSD. Look at at least four four different type of symptoms there. Um, so that that is re-experiencing hyperarousal, intrusive thoughts, um, hypervigilance, and so when they have like nightmares, intrusive thoughts of the event itself. So something had happened let's say, uh, you know, somebody got shot or something, or somebody got raped, or they have witnessed somebody being killed, or they have been bullied in a way where they thought they were physically in danger, that they are going to die. One of the appraisal in terms of PTSD is uh, that 
you know, I, I, I was going to die and maybe I am dead in some way. I, I have changed as a person. I'm no longer the same person anymore after that incident. So, so there is about fundamentally, there is something about um, that I'm going to die because of the danger that, that was happening or the body changed or I am changed as a person. Uh, then we have disassociation, intrusive thoughts, depending on the uh, symptoms of trauma and the severity that you know you will be treating them. But it's a. They also say instead of anxiety disorders, they say maybe it's a memory form disorder because it's about the memory and what had happened in the past, uh, and there are issues related to memory um, that the memory had not been saved as like the normal everyday memory. So traumatic memories were quite fragmented, um, and therefore every time you have the triggers, for an example, smell, um, sounds. Um, touch, sense, um, that it get triggered. For an example, some, if, if ha somebody had been kind of harmed by a policeman and they see a uniform in a different place, for an example, those who had been going through a war in a war country or something like that, they come to England, if they see the policeman, a street very friendly, trying to support people, but can have a panic attack and feeling, you know, having intrusive memories and maybe re-experiencing the event because that uniform triggered the person to feel what had happened in their homeland, home country. So these are the things that kind of, uh, you know, the that we kind of talk about PTSD as a result of these symptoms. I might send you. Uh, um, a talk related to PTSD, so you, you can have a look at that. Um, and social anxiety, social phobia, this is people with social phobia. Uh, they are af afraid of other people, will think um, badly of them, fear negative evaluation, so they take steps to prevent this from happening. Say for an example, not speaking in public, maybe it could be the students. Um, here, I don't know, see, there, therefore you have to be watch out for cultural things. So we cannot diagnose everybody with social anxiety. There's a possibility culturally people don't speak. Um, and maybe they think it's very respectful of not speaking to uh, the lecturers and things like that. Um, it could be that. But here we, we, we could say that, you know, people who have scared, you know, they, they are kind of, they have fear they are scared of speaking in social situations. And they might be thinking, they might mind read other people and thinking they are thinking they are inadequate, they are stupid, they are boring. Um, and that is really, you know, that evokes panic. And, um, and they will become a kind of avoiding social situation, isolating themselves for a long period of time. And then perhaps when they get depressed, they come. Or if they are students, they would say, you know, I, I am finding it very difficult to make, do a presentation because presentations are very important, isn't it? As you're, you know, when you're a student, you need to go stand in front of everybody and do a presentation. They are unable to do it. So they will then approach and they will seek support and they will come those times. Um, but it, it can be really, really, the, the, in terms of living a life, it can be really difficult for people with social anxiety. Um, Specific phobia is also any phobia, so object. So it could be a specific object that you are scared of, animal you are scared of, or situation you are scared of. They might know that their fear is irrational or out of proportion, but will nevertheless try to avoid feared object or situation. So that could be specific phobia. Let's say that somebody is involving in a car accident, right? Um, and, 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 and they could have PTSD if they have all the symptoms of PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, which is the, which we talked about the re-experiencing intrusive thoughts, flashbacks and all these things. But if they don't have that, they just don't want to drive. They avoid driving. And, and we could say that they don't have any nightmares. They don't have any uh, other flashbacks re-experiencing. So they don't have, so we cannot diagnose them with, with PT, PTSD. However, they might have a specific phobia, so which we could 
say like fear of driving and work with just the driving phobia because they don't have they don't have other symptoms so so you can see how how it can manifest in 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 different level so health anxiety can ha happen to people who have i have been working with someone who was diagnosed with cancer 10 years ago or something and they had successful treatment but still they are living in fear like the cancer is going to come up and they scan they go for um, checkups and things like that so it's okay to go for your regular monthly or yearly checkups that's fine but if you do excessively if you're scanning a little sensations in your toe as I am developing cancer in my toe, so that's excessive. So you can you can understand that. And in terms of panic attacks, again, you know, people have like um, uh, beliefs that I'm going to have a heart attack. So there is a possibility people who already had heart attack might have panic attack. Uh, they might develop panic attack. But so these are the things we need to kind of trace and you know try to understand and work with that. Um, so that takes a little bit of more thinking and understanding and reflection. Any questions? I quickly went through it, but we are going to look at panic disorder today. Any questions from anyone? The, is this new information for you? Have you heard about this before? Anyone want to comment on that before we move on? No? Okay, so let's move on. Uh, miss? Yes? Uh, so now, so you were talking about that uh, phobia and panic, right? Yes. So, I mean, so when we feel like through this CBT, we try to teach them a way to think, like how to control their thoughts, mm -hmm. will it ever actually Will they be ever actually cured of it or will it recur all the time? Okay, so one of the things I'm going to share in terms of the thoughts, we are not going to look at thoughts, Shiva Sundaran, here, because for that I need two years with you to, 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 to work with the thoughts and um, we are going to do behavioral. So CBT got cognitive behavioral therapy, right? So last time what I talked about was for depression as well is behavior, BA, behavioral activation. So that's very short form. And I know that I'm not, it's, it's unfair that I'm not talking to you about anything else. I'll be happy to set up a two years diploma course in, 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 in like a postgraduate kind of diploma in Jaffna where we can maybe talk about you know fully but here uh, Siva Sundaran I'm only speaking about um, I'm going to only speak about <laughs> behaviors and how to be we do behavior work it is easier but you are right you asked me whether um, it is which one I will tell you what which one is difficult and I'll tell you a little bit about percentages so any kind of, let's say that I'm going to talk about England and the IAP service here, the recovery rate we are looking at, you know, that we, when we are working that they will be looking at who is recovering, who is not recovering and things like that. So we do look at the recovery rate. Um, for services who are doing really well, they will have to at least the recovery rate for anything, yes? Any, any anxiety, depressive disorders, they are looking at 50% of recovery because CBT is, should be working like 50% you know, recovery for, for any of the disorders that we are seeing. So you are doing well if, if you are having that 50% of, of recovery as a service. So I'm talking about service. But we, if, when, we, when we come to kind of individually, if I'm going to share, and that is personal, some people can really work with, well with generalized anxiety disorder, worry, health anxiety, and uh, obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, so the, the, the recovery rates varies. So I'm not saying everything is 50% here, 50% for general anxiety, health anxiety, or obsessive uh, disorder. It's depending on the severity and the presentation, it varies. Some, it's, it could be just management for some people rest of their life, uh, you know, that we are ma they are managing them using uh, the strategies. But if they manage well, it's, it's great, isn't it? Um, for an example, one of in incident post-traumatic stress disorder 
it is 90 percentage. The recovery is really, really high in terms of PTSD. Uh, but then it has to be a one-off incident, something like that. So Adler's and Clark's model uh, for PTSD is that's the one people are using trauma-focused CBT, and that's you know people recover. I have seen complete recovery with, 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 with some people. So PTSD is one of my favorite because people recover uh, from that. So, but the difficulties, are, so, so I'm not going to say that, you know, people people do, people don't. So, so we are looking around, you know, at least 50 percentage kind of recovery when it comes to overall, um, but individually, you know, we have different one. For an example, talking about obsessive compulsive uh, disorder here, it's the first thing uh, is, medical treatment. So it is important that they trial uh, medication and combination of medication. All of them could be combination medication, but when they come to work with you, if they are really doing well, then you, you, know, you kind of go back and review the medication and reduce the doses, reduce the doses. And at the end, then if they are really doing well, then they can come off the medication. So that's how it, you know, it looks like. But we will look at panic disorder today in detail. The other ones, we are not going to go into detail today. Does that answer your question, Shivasundaran? I, I don't know whether this answers your question. Uh, the thing is, uh, when, I, when I was just randomly reading, I, I read one of the one therapy books just for, you know, just when I was free. Yeah. So the name of it was uh, Rewire Your Brain or something like that. Okay. So in that process, what they do is they try to, you know, uh, what is that? When a thought initiates, they try to break it at the start itself. Yeah. So it is like a habit. And once they stop that habit, everything could return if they yes. stop doing it. Yes, yes. So yeah. rewiring, what we are talking about more, the, the uh, so there are different types of therapies. Like cognitive therapy is like looking at evidence for evidence against. Yes. In yes. terms of the, uh, the cognitive restructuring. So now we are coming to thought, we are talking about thoughts, although we are not meant to go in there <laughs> because you talked about wiring and rewiring. That's very much in MBCT, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. And uh, so they talk about wiring and rewiring and you know, the more you are bringing yourself back to just noticing thoughts as they are rather than you know, getting entangled into a relationship with, with the thought. So you can work with thought in that way. But with cognitive restructuring, it's more like they are kind of looking for evidence for that thought, evidence against that thought. For an example, if somebody with health anxiety say, um, I have cancer, right? So we have say, we agree with you, the theory A. So we do theory A and theory B. Theory A, yes, I have cancer. And therefore, I have particular sensations I am experiencing in my toe, whatever, wherever that is. Uh, and as a result of this is happening, that is happening. We say, accept it. Okay, fine. You can behave like you have cancer. You can go to Google and research for hours and hours and hours about the toe cancer, whatever it is. And, uh, and that is theory A. Theory B would be, um, I worry I have cancer, but I do not have cancer. So I'm going to, so therefore I will not be Googling da, 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 for three days or something like that. So we get them to do these two things. One, they pretend they have cancer, they go do everything they do and they we measure the anxiety at the end. So how much those three days, the anxiety. And then we get them to kind of say, I worry for the, these three days uh, and they don't engage in any sort of behaviors. It's better I go through panic disorder than you can understand what behaviors, safety seeking behaviors are. So, and then they drop it and they measure the anxiety. You know, they will find the anxiety is less on those days where they didn't actually engaging in safety seeking behaviors. And man, I mean, so, of these two, of these two methods, yes. is, is uh, I mean, which one is more like successive or anything like that? More success? Yes. Depending on the person. So for some people, uh, behavioral experiments like this is also kind of, you know, cognitive restructuring. The other one is more like, uh, you know, thought record, which is like evidence for evidence against. What's the evidence for your thought? Yeah. So they have to give thought, real fact, factual evidence. And then they have to give 
real factual, for an example, in generalized anxiety, what's the factual evidence in terms of that your husband is having an affair or something, yes? And then in terms of that, they would say, no, my husband loves me, he's, he comes home on time, he's with me all the time, he bought, buys me flower, whatever, whatever. And what's the evidence for that he's ha actually having an affair? Nothing. So although I feel that he's uh, having an uh, affair, the evidence suggests he's not or something. I'm making this up. So that is the evidence-based thought. So Shiva Shandran, we can work with thoughts in a different way. Then I can say another thing, which is MBCT, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, and say, welcome those thoughts. You know, sit with those thoughts and feel the anxiety and, you know, just sit for some time and coming back to your breath again and let them go because thoughts are not facts. They come, stay for a while and they disappear. So you be change the relationship with the thought. Mm -hmm. So there are so different madam, aspects. I, uh, so yeah. madam, if, if we reinforce cognitive, I mean, therapy, it will eventually lead to the rewiring of the brain. It will have to, isn't it? The neurons that fire together, wire together. They say, when you have a neurons that's firing together, um, Sundaran, when you have a thought, right? So when you say that, um, uh, you know, when, when you are believing in certain things, the, the neurons, they get stimulated, they fire up fire. And then what happens is the, the, the habituation, the strong belief becomes like that. For an example, when somebody is driving and they're having an accident and the thoughts like every time I go into a car, I'll have an accident, I'll have some accident. So the neurons will fire. And then that the, the, the belief becomes stronger. Um, so that's why they say the, the neurons uh, fire together, wire together. So the wiring happens and, and it becomes a stronger belief. What we ne need to do is we need to tackle that. And that's not true. So when they have a positive, I'm going to talk about this, uh, uh, Shiva Sundaran, later on. Shall oh, we okay. talk yeah, about sure. it? Because I think I'll go into detail so you can understand more. But Am I making sense when I'm saying that? It's yes, like a competition. There's a competition. You have a belief. We try to change that belief, not with positive thinking, with evidence. Yes, I understand. That is CBT because it's an evidence-based therapy. So when we are kind of doing that, that's when you are right. So the rewiring will happen, unlearning. Yeah? So we have learned something. That's the learning theory. But now we need to unlearn what we have learned because that's not correct what we have learned. Okay. Yes. So let's look at, so we have just very briefly looked at anxiety disorders and we will be looking at panic attacks then. So panic attack is kind of um, an abrupt surge of intense fear or intense discomfort that reaches a peak within minutes and during which time four or more symptoms occur okay so we will talk about that later so note symptoms are present presented for the purpose of identifying identifying a panic attack however panic attack is not a mental disorder and cannot be coded panic attacks can occur in the context of any anxiety disorder as well as other mental disorders so you can see the panic attack it can happen i'm sure that you know, all of us experience panic attack once in a life. So with people, people are kind of familiarized with what panic attacks is maybe. It's rare that people don't experience it. Maybe there are people who don't experience a panic attack at all. Um, so let's look at it. And I'm going to go through very quickly because I want to come to the interesting part what Suvasandran was talking about. Um, what is it? Panic attacks are, uh, as I said, it's an abstract surge of intense fear or discomfort that reaches a peak within minutes and which involve feeling at least four of the following symptoms, palpitation, pounding heart, accelerated heart rate, sweating, trembling, shaking, sensations of shortness of breath, um, feeling of choking, chest pain, discomfort, nausea, abdominal distress, uh, feeling dizzy, unsteady, lightheaded, fainting kind of sensations, not really fainting, chills or uh, heat sensations, numbness or tingling sensations, derealization, depersonalization, maybe 
you know, then, you know, people talk about this disassociation, but in panic, we only talk about derealization or depersonalization, fear of losing control, going crazy, fear of dying. I'd rather not talk about anything else. I think you know what that is, but derealization or depersonalization, do you know what that is? Please tell me, otherwise uh, I will move on. If you know, then I will move on. Because I thought like everything else would make chance, sense except those two things. Can anyone tell me what that is? Okay. So Maybe, this is, yes. Yeah. Yeah, Maybe go, the go person on. has, uh, normally the panic, it goes like a cascade of events in a positive feedback. Mm -hmm. So once you think something, it will only get worse from there. Yes. So from that point, we can think that eventually the negative thoughts become so much that it totally detaches the person from reality. Yeah, yeah. It is a detached from um, reality. So in, in some way, the experience of this is a particular sensation. Sometimes it just happened with, without other symptoms of panic. Um, it can kind of stand alone, kind of. Some people have that they, they it is called depersonalization disorder. It's more like a freeze response. So let's like look at the symptoms of that. So you, they would be, let's say some, uh, I was speaking to a client um, who are suffering from depersonalization disorder actually. So what happens is um, that they, you know, they will be like normal, like just like us. Out of the blue, um, there was a possibility. This is how they describe. Out of the blue, suddenly they feel like they are not in their body and they can see everything like rotating around them. And, uh, you, you know, they feel like they are floating up here or there was a sense of, you know, they are not there. The time elapses, like time moves on and oh, there is a like, slow motion of everything is happening very slowly, surrounding, oh, everything is moving in a, in a slow movement kind of fashion. So people will be describing in a different ways how they are experiencing this depersonalization, but it can be very, very difficult uh, when, when they go through it and very, very scary. And it's almost like a freeze response. The body goes into a kind of freezing. So they will be standing in one place. The, the arousal that they experience in panic, that's different. So it's more like, freeze response so is um, it, we can, can can we say that the person is entering uh, where he's uh, doing third person narration they could they could they know what is happening to them so there is a sense of connection with them when it is too much there's a possibility they don't they might say i don't remember what had happened in that period of time but but certainly they do have a sense of what is happening to them most of the time yeah so third per person narration you could be we could kind of say that but what i am trying to kind of get hold of of how the experiences look like so it's almost like a freeze kind of mode rather than fight mode does that make sense so we have fight or flight and this is more like a freeze um if i could use an example uh, what what does the why does the body do the does that is like, you know, when you have, um, you know, when you are connecting all the plugs into one long plug or something, and it becomes too much for electricity kind of, you, you know, so when there was excess of that, sometimes the fuse goes off, you know, you are, you are using some equipment, the fuse goes off, the electricity is cut down. It's a bit like that, because things are too much, and therefore, the emotions are cut down. So they don't experience the emotions in a heightened level. Does that make sense? Yes. So more like freezing. You know how the freezing is more like, say for an example, a cat is running uh, to get the mouse and uh, mouse just kind of, you know, goes into this freeze mode pretending that it's kind of dead. So the cat is not going to bite it because the cat is going to leave and look at it. Oh, it's dead or something. And that's the time then the mouse would run faster as possible, come out. So, the, so it, that kind of freeze also help us to escape danger. So the body can produce that. And depersonalization is a little bit like that. Is that okay? Oh, yes, I understand. 
Okay, great. So what causes the panic disorder is that there is no single cause for panic. Some of the factors uh, that make it more likely that you will experience panic attacks and panic disorder, and that, that could include strong biological reactions to stress, anxiety sensitivity, cognitive biases, including catastrophizing. For an example, thinking habits can be learned. Sometimes exposure to caregivers where they, you know, they, they were catastroph So for an example, let's say mothers, they might be saying certain things, avoid this, uh, you know, and they get frightened or they will have a panic attack looking at something. So that, that, that can kind of, uh, you know, help others to learn. So when they say help others to learn, it's, it's a particular learning process, actually, everything is. And, and they, then they learn to panic. Um, other psychological problems, people suffering from wide range of uh, psychological problem often experience panic attack. For example, post-traumatic disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, social anxiety, health anxiety, depression. Um, you know, they may all experience panic attacks. So genetic factors could, could play a part as well. So what happens in panic? Okay, what, so let's look at what happens in panic, how a panic attack develops. Notice a body sensations, my breathing feels odd. Have a thought about it, could this be dangerous? Feel apprehensive, anxiety strengthens the body sensations, have more thoughts, this is really bad. Pay more attention to the body and feel more apprehensive. Um, that means have even more catastrophic thoughts. This is getting even worse. I think I'm going to pass out and feelings of panic reach their peak. So uh, the feelings of panic, what happens reach their peak, then they, 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 then they will have a panic attack. So they focus on one thing and in their body because the body is the one that, that kind of tell us that we are feeling uncomfortable in the body and that could be a sensation and that could be then misinterpreted as something dangerous is taking place. Okay, so panic attacks being on the lookout for dangerous body sensations, misinterpretation of body sensations. You can misinterpret that something happening in the body or oh, that is really harmful, something bad is going to happen. Avoidance of feared situations or body sensations or safety seeking behaviors. So safety seeking behaviors are things that you do to you, you try to prevent a catastrophic catastrophe from occurring like avoidance. Safety behaviors prevent you from learning how dangerous that situation really is or how well you could really cope with that. So we will talk about safety seeking behaviors later, but let's look at how the vicious cycle of panic looked like. Um, the panic would look like this. So we are, we are going to be being on the lookout for dangerous body sensations. The unintended outcome would be the more you look for danger, the more you are likely to notice, okay? And the misinterpretation of what body sensations mean, you see catastrophe even when there is no danger, okay? And then what happens, unintended outcome is, you never get to learn how dangerous it really is or how well you could cope if it were. So safety seeking behaviors will prevent you from experiencing the panic again. For an example, let's say somebody goes to gym and they are on the gym and they are running and suddenly they feel something in their heart and they are kind of misinterpreting that symptoms of palpitations for, oh, I'm going to have a heart attack or something. I better stop doing this because you know they are sweating, they feel dizzy, everything else is happening. And suddenly the behavior will become, I will never go to gym again. So therefore the safety seeking behaviors is avoidance of gym. And even uh, just, just going past a gym, you know, they might go just walk past a gym, they might start to have that panic sensations coming up. And that is very interesting in panic disorder. Uh, because with heart attack, you, you don't go, you don't go past the gym, and then suddenly you start to have uh, symptoms. Okay, so um, and then the avoidance of uh, 
feared situation or body sensations. So what you would be doing, you will be avoiding that situation. You might not even say the word gym. And if anyone say, say the word gym, you would have st started to have that sensations. So you see, so it could be avoidance of even speaking about gym, not uttering the word gym, but it also kind of avoidance of going to gym. Okay, so let's look at what happens in terms of the problem specification. As we said, panic attacks is panic attack, but panic disorder is something else. And that is where we have a diagnostic category, which you can kind of look at it. So um, <clears throat> panic attack is defined, defined um, above. We talked about four symptoms, didn't we? And it must occur because without that, we don't call it panic attack. So at least one of the attacks has been followed by one month of one or both of the following. So it has to be like a prolonged time, isn't it? It's not like if you had like one or two here and there, uh, we wouldn't uh, diagnose you with panic disorder. So persistent concern, worry about additional panic attacks or their consequences, losing control, having a heart attack or going crazy. These are the three, these are the things that people example that they think about having a heart attack, going crazy, going mad and going mad, something like that. So imagine when people are going through depersonalization or derealization, it's a very kind of difficult sensation to kind of uh, feel and and therefore they might think that is madness and that's how madness look like people make sense of you, you know what going crazy looked like because they don't know what that is so they kind of make sense in in that way a significant maladaptive change in behavior related to the attack behaviors designed to avoid having panic attacks such as avoidance or exercise or unfamiliar situations the disturbance is not attributable to physiological effects of substance or other medical condition. So the disturbance is not better explained by other mental disorder and other mental disorder, for an example, panic attacks occur, as I said, in, in social situation, if you, because the, the people are dangerous at that time. Um, so we are not, that's not panic disorder, then that's social anxiety, right? So it's like that. Okay. So let's kind of move on because we don't want to spend too much time um, with that. So agoraphobia is, is, is very much linked to panic disorders because when we are diagnosing panic disorder with agoraphobia, panic dos disorder without agoraphobia, and sometimes some uh, you know, clinicians might say it's, it's all the same. Um, so, but let's look at what agoraphobia is. It's marked fear or anxiety about two or more of the following situation, um, using public uh, transportation, being in open spaces, being in enclosed spaces, standing in line or being in a crowd, being outside of the home. So that, that, that could be the, the marked fear or anxiety about two or more. If you do need to have like two or more to kind of diagnose with this. Um, so the B is like um, uh, the individual fears or avoids the situation because of thoughts that escape might be difficult. I am stuck, something like that. Okay, I cannot move on. So the panic happens. Um, example, fear of falling uh, in the elderly fear. So when you, when you are older, you might say I'm going to fall or fear of having uh, incontinence and things like that. But then you explain and you stay indoors. So, so some of the people who might not go out if they don't have public toilets or something like that, it's very hard for them to go out and that, that the avoidance can develop. Uh, and the agoraphobic situations almost always provoke fear or anxiety. So being in the crowd that they cannot handle it, being closed kind of spaces, lifts, things like that. So, so they are kind of avoiding those situation. So it, it continues. The agrophobic situation are actively avoided, ac recur the present of a compa companion, or are endured with in intense fear or anxiety. So they can take someone else with them, and they, they are able to go there. But apart from that, you know, the place is avoided. So the fear of anxiety is out of proportion to the actual danger posed by the agrophobic situations and to the socio-cultural context. Um, 
well, say, say for an example, if it is, this is where you need to think about, is it really dangerous to go out, uh, you know, after this time, you know, in dark, sometimes people are, feel, you know, scared of going out in dark. So again, it has to be clearly, you know, you need to kind of find out from, from the culture, socio-cultural context, maybe it is dangerous to go out in Sri Lanka after six or something. There is a fear maybe in particular place that women may get attacked, I don't know. So, so these are the things we might want to kind of pay attention to. Um, yeah, so the, the fear of anxiety avoidance, um, where are we? Okay, so the fear, anxiety, or avoidance causes clinically significant distress. And if another medical condition is present, the fear, anxiety, or avoidance is clearly excessive. Um, the fear, anxiety, avoidance is not better uh, explored or explained by symptoms of another mental health disorder and agoraphobia is diagnosed irrespective of the presence of panic disorder. Okay, so let's move on. I was going to actually play a video so you could see how panic, or oh, maybe I'll send that to you so you can you know, watch it. So treatments, um, <laughs> thank you, Shiva Zundran. I put, it, I put it here because I thought like last time I didn't do it. Uh, psychological, the treatment of choice for panic disorder is cognitive behavioral therapy. If CBT is delivered face-to-face, -face, then the optimal range is between seven and 14 hours of therapy, typically in the form of weekly session, one to two hours. Depending on what kind of experiments that you are doing with them, you might be taking them to places where they are actually having panic attacks and things like that, so to induce panic attack. So guided self-help is also there. Um, which, which, you know, maybe six sessions, half an hour, where you are actually sending them the self-help material, they read it, they try to do the experiments. So the medical uh, kind of treatment is also there. Um, so it is recommended that only medication, medicines that should be used um, in the long-term management of panic disorder are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, SSRIs, that's, that's that's one of the thing. And then uh, tricyclic antidepressants. So they suggest that benzodiazepines are associated with poor and long-term outcomes, so should not be prescribed. So that's something you, know, you can think about. Again, it's the same when you are doing combination of medication, um, uh, medication and treatment, you can kind of see uh, that they can reduce the doses, they can go to reviews, and then maybe they can completely stop at the end of the treatment. But that needs to be kind of negotiated by three people because the, the psychologist here, the clinical psychologist, they don't kind of prescribe medication, although they are talking about it, maybe that we should be doing that in the future and thinking like that. But um, we don't do that. I think in US maybe, I don't know, with license they do that. But here in the UK, the clinical psychologist, they don't prescribe medication. So. Uh, we work with our GP or the, a psychiatrist that, you know, it's three ways always, a little bit of a, a, a multidisciplinary team, but not for, um, not if it is not, if it is not severe, you know, you, you don't have to do that, but uh, with the multidisciplinary team, but certainly in terms of reviewing medication and everything, it can be done by a GP or a psychiatrist here. Okay, and, and I think it's the same in, in, in Sri Lanka as well, that, that the medica medical review happens with your general practitioner or GP, if he is well-versed with, with psychiatric medica medication or a psychiatrist. So, um, okay. The reason I'm moving quite quickly, so we can talk about treatments and we can talk about VA and, and what we are doing here. So let's look at it. Now you have assessed, you have identified the five areas, you have asked the client what is going on for them, and your PSS is going to help uh, to identify the areas to address goal focus on behavioral change. As I said, Siva Sundaran, we are not talking about thought change. It is a little bit, um, cognitive therapy is, you know, it, at least two years of, um, study required to work using cognitive aspects maybe. 
sessions like this, it's better to kind of focus on behavioral and it is easier and it is simple. Even the clients themselves can, with the self-help material, start working on their behaviors. As I said, we will only talk about behaviors here. But because you have been talking about thoughts, we, we, you know, we could do that as well. But the behavioral therapist will argue when the behavior change, the thoughts will change as well. And therefore, we don't need to actively go and do some work with the thoughts. But the cognitive therapist may say something and they might have that, you know, their, 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 their back and forth arguments around that. Is it behavioral therapy? Is it cognitive therapy? So we say we combine both together, the, the CBT people, we combine together and say, let's work on both then. So let's ensure that we don't leave this aspect out. We don't leave that out uh, aspects out. We do it together, we combine them together. So that is CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, is a combination of cognitive therapy and a behavioral therapy, which is which which is standalone therapies. They exist like that, but CBT is putting them together um, and we call it cognitive behavioral therapy. And we, we apply both behavioral techniques and cognitive techniques. So goal is focus on behavioral change. So remember to transform broad and negatively started goals into smart and behavioral goals. So they will, you, they will have some goals. So you will have to be smart <laughs> and change them into smart and behavioral goals because we are not going to <laughs> talk about the cognitive aspects um, here in terms of when we are doing some behavioral work. So to not experience panic attacks, to, to be able to use tube. Well, you don't have tube over there. Sorry, that's very, not really mindful of me. So to be able to use bus. Okay, shall we put that there or train? It's just an example. It doesn't have to be this, okay? I'm just making this up. So to, to get to, uh, to, to get to and work during rush hour, okay? Um, so what we are looking at is to get to work and kind of do that in, during the rush hour, because when there are lots of people, that's when they might get panicky, not be able to get into the bus. They might feel I'm stuck and not be able to get out from the bus or something like that. So always there is a reason why people are coming for therapy, because either they cannot go to work using public transport and they have been walking for like five hours a day or something. It's not working anymore and therefore they need some help. So your exposure hierarchy will then include smaller smart, smart goals and that will enable the patient to work towards using the, I'm going to change this to bus. Uh, sorry. I'm messing around here, okay, using the bus during rush hour. Okay, go on to the bus. Go on the bus at a quieter time of the day. So we start with, okay, you don't take the bus at all. No, I don't take the bus at all. Okay, so what do we do? Um, we want to get you to, um, uh, in the bus at a quieter time. Don't worry about it because we are doing graded hierarchy, yeah? So we can imagine, you can imagine like a ladder. So we are going to do the first step is just go to the bus station. Second step is actually stay when there was a bus comes there. Third step is getting the patient to in, in the bus in a quieter time. So there are not many people, there are two or three there. And the fourth step so it's almost like you're going up in the ladder do you see that so that is how we are kind of cre creating fear hierarchy remember this is just an example you will be creative with whatever your patient is kind of sharing in terms of their panic and that's what you will be working with i'm just using this for an example of how to kind of get into the bus and get them travel so the first day they will they wouldn't even go by the bus station because you know they, they say like, no, I can't go there. So we kind of accompany them and they are, so they are there. They can see the bus and then they can get on the bus in a quieter time and then they can come out on the next step, stop because they cannot travel for a long time. They will be panicking and saying like, I can't do this anymore. So we kind of say, all right, let's come out. Um, 
and then we do it over and over again where they develop uh, the arousal level is not, you know, they are not panicking, the arousal level is okay. And then we say, let's travel to another stop. Let's do it when there is more crowd. So likewise, you will be designing those experiments. Actually, not experiments, I shouldn't say experiments, exposure, because you are taking them through an exposure hierarchy. Okay, that is behavioral exposure. What do you do then before you taking them there? Oh, sorry, I will have to kind of, you know what PSS is? You know what PSS is? We talked about maybe last time, I don't remember. But the PSS is always after you have kind of assessed, uh, you will have a problem statement summary. Problem statements are very important. You are giving a summary to the client, a major summary to the client saying, this is the summary of the problem. So summary of the problem as patient experience it, mini formulation of maintenance cycle, the five areas that you have identified, fight and how this problem is impacting on the person. So this person is not traveling to work uh, and therefore, you know, they are unable to kind of attend work. So not a list of problems or general summary. General summary and a list of problem is not going to help you. It's very important that you do that kind of, when you are gathering information using those five areas and really doing that, bringing that mini formulation and draws a line under information gathering part of the interview. That's what you are doing. Like with the, this is the main functions of problem statement summary. You then start shift from fact finding to collaboration. So you both are collaborating. Client is saying, yes, that's the problem. You are saying that's the problem. And you are kind of formulating that together and then provides a reference point for the problem and a, and a way to monitor change. Okay, so this is how we are going to do it. So that's the problem statement summary. So you are kind of summarizing uh, using your five areas. You're talking about how this problem is impacting and you are talking about how you're going to exit this problem by focusing on their behaviors, okay? And the psychoeducation is fight or flight response, physiological symptoms. Um, and the important first step, explanation of anxiety as a result of survival, physiological reaction being triggered. Psychoeducation is important part because we are not hiding any information from the client. Client needs to know. That itself, Shiva Sundaran helps the client to do some cognitive restructuring, really. I'm, I am going to look into what psychoeducation does in, in detail, a little bit more research, but there are the research suggests psychoeducation itself is having an impact on how clients view a problem. Those who have been thinking, I am mad, I am, you know, I'm suffering from mental illness and things like that. When they started to look at fight or flight response, you could even say it happens to me when I am in fear. You know, if I if there is a snake falls in front of me, of course I'm going to kind of go through this kind of responses as well. And it's normal for everybody to go through this uh, uh, fear response. And then, then they calm down a little, they understand it. And education, knowledge helps them to make sense of what is going on for them. So explanation of anxiety, you need to do it this in Tamil actually, um, or in Sinhalese or any language that you are using, because those people who are coming to see you probably they might be not interested in hearing this in English. So they might want to hear it either in Sinhalese or in Tamil. So range of normal physiological changes in the body as a result of adrenaline being released to help us fight, flight, freeze in the face of danger. In panic, this response often triggered off when no obvious physical threat. Misfiring, the panic alarm, you can use that. Uh, I used this before. Uh, you know, in the house, there was a uh, alarm is there. It, it serves us to protect us. Um, but what happens is that sometimes you are cooking a nice meal. The um, So when you are cooking a nice meal, it triggers the panic to go, uh, sorry, the fire alarm to go because it's a sensitive fire alarm. So likewise, the amygdala part in our brain can be sensitive to danger and therefore it can go off and thinking you are in actual danger when you are just thinking of something. So these educations are very important that this misfiring 
uh, and the client is not actually uh, in danger. So there is no snake there, but they are having a thought. Panic then involves catastrophic misinterpretations of bodily sensations. The way a person thinks and behaves in response to these sensations then maintains it. So let's look at it. In panic, how, how are we going to do psychoeducation in panic? I would like to hear from you. <laughs> ha, this is interesting because I don't want to share everything. Shivasantran, Bhavana, Shambhavi, and um, sorry, I forgot your name. Is it with the with, with, with Shani? 2018 FM, is it with the Sani? So can you tell me, how do you offer psychoeducation? Please do it very quickly because then, you know, it's, it's, it's easier for us. Then I can move on quickly, talk about other things. Try Pannungo, Yaravadu. Shivasundaran, do you want to try? Because you are very good. I really like all your questions and the way you ask things. So is Bhavana, you can try as well. How do we offer psychoeducation in so, panic? Uh, first, uh, we have to tell them what it is, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the fact that they are having the sensation, these bodily sensations, and then uh, we can even tell them like from which and which system. Like for an example, it may be their cardiovascular system, then they get the angina, chest pain, mm -hmm. chest tightness, and they can go on towards respiratory, breathing, shortness of breath, the neurological mm -hmm. meaning, shaking, tremor. <laughs> yeah, like yeah. That. I mean, this is what beautiful about the doctors because they go, you go into all the uh, psychoeducation, you could, you could go into detail about it. But yes, but what is most important to, 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 to do when we are doing psychoeducation? I want to stay here because I think this is important aspects. What is most important that we do when we are starting instead of giving information like I am doing, and I'm really, I don't give information like that. I always ask uh, my students questions, but I thought like, because, you know, just go, let's do it quickly. And, and I felt like the Sri Lankan students may be not so interested in talking. So I am, I am learned, I'm shaped by that and I'm quickly running through as well now. But how do we offer psychoeducation? We um, ask them, what is your understanding? Why do you think this is happening? Yes? Shivasundran, yes. the first step. Stay with me, Shivasundran. Uh, unblock, uh, pan, uh, sorry, mute Pannadinga. Stay with me. Let's talk about this together. So what, Shivasundran, you can be my patient. Or shall I be your patient? Uh, I'll be the patient. <laughs> That's easier. That's easier for you. Okay. <laughs> so, so let's say that you are suffering from panic disorder. Shall we? Yes. So I'm going to speak to you. So, Shiva Shundran, uh, welcome to the session today. Let's look at what is going on for you. So, would you like to tell me uh, what is going on in terms of uh, your, your problem? So, what, what is going on for you? How do you explain this? So, we, we kind of find out what is going on for you, Shiva Shundran. Let's just stay there. Let me not confuse you. So, explain to me, why do you think this is happening? You talked about some of the symptoms. Why do you think this is happening? Uh, I had uh, start initially before attempting uh, something I had a certain goal but mm -hmm. when I went there the circumstances that I faced made me lose track of my function. Okay that is good Sh Shivashandran and you have told me what is going on for you. You said you had heart, heart pul palpitation, you find it difficult to breathe and, and, and you notice all these symptoms. Why do you think this is happening? Would you have an idea why you, you had all these symptoms? The body is uh, trying to make me aware of a certain scenario or mm -hmm. some unaddressed issue. You think so? Do you think the panic disorder patient would say that, Shiva? <laughs> <laughs> you have to act now as a panic disorder. Let me act. I'll do much better than you. <laughs> you are speaking like a doctor. <laughs> so, 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 so why do you think? 
that this mm -hmm. is happening. Mm -hmm. So they will be say, I'm having a heart attack, Shiva. <laughs> I'm going to tell you everything. <laughs> I have never been in such a scenario. So it was, I was, uh, I had no, no idea of what could happen. I was in a state of doubt. Yeah. Shiva, do you want to be the psychologist? Can I be the panic disorder patient? I'll okay. do much better than you. <laughs> okay? Okay. 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 So, do you want to do it in Tamil or English? Tamil is the patient's popping. Tamil is the English and the term is the same. English is the same. And the Tamil is the same. Okay. 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 எனக்கு வந்து நெஞ்சு பட பட அடிக்குது எனக்கு வந்து ஏலாமே இருக்குது இரவுல கூட திடீரென்று எனக்கு நித்திர கொள்ள ஏலாமே இருக்குது திடீரென்று நடு இரவுல கூட அப்படி நடக்குது எழும்பி தண்ணீர் எல்லாம் குடிச்சு பார்த்தேன் எனக்கு வந்து ஏலாது ஏலாது தண்ணி அதெல்லாம் உதவி செய்யல நான் நினைக்கிறேன் எனக்கு நெஞ்சில ஏதோ வருத்தம் இருக்குது நான் நினைக்கிறேன் வந்து எனக்கு வந்து ஹார்ட் அட்டாக் வரப்போதுன்னு நினைக்கிறேன் when did you feel this for the first time? I was told that I was a psychoeducation. I was told that I was a doctor and I was told that I was a heart attack. What do you think about it? I was told that I was a heart attack. அந்தே நேரத்துல இப்படி ஜோசிக்க கூட தன்மை இருக்கு அந்த நேரத்தை வாக்கமா இப்ப நீங்க அந்த சிச்சுவேஷன்ல வேற இருக்கீங்க உங்களுக்கு தெரியும் என்ன நடக்குதுன்னு நீங்க சொல்றீங்களா அப்ப இது ஹார்ட் அட்டாக் இல்லையே எனக்கு சரியான கஸ்டமா இருக்கு டாக்டர் நான் வந்து யோசிச்சேனா இது வந்து ஹார்ட் அட்டாக் அண்ட் என்னுடைய பிள்ளையிலையும் கேட்டேன் என்ன டாக்டரோட கூட்டி கொண்டு போங்கோட ஒருத்தரும் கூட்டி கொண்டு வேற இல்ல அதனால நான் கஷ்டப்பட்ட எந்த பாட்டிலேயே வந்துட்டேன் உங்களோட கதை கேட்கல கூட எனக்கு நெஞ்சு பட படன்னு அடிக்குது சில வேலை எனக்கு இப்ப கூட ஏதாவது நடக்கலாம எனக்கு தலை சுத்துற மாதிரியும் இருக்குது சத்தி வரவங்களையும் இருக்குது அப்ப ஃபர்ஸ்ட் அப்ப நான் முதலாவது ஒரு பிரீதிங் எக்ஸசைஸ் மாதிரி ஒரு இனிஷியேட் பண்ணிட்டு இஃப் த பேஷண்ட் வாண்ட்ஸ் மெடிக்கல் எவிடன்ஸ் தென் சிம்பிள் டெஸ்ட் லைக் லிபிட் ப்ரொஃபைல் ஆர் மேபி அன் இசிஜி கேன் ப்ரொவைட் சப்போர்ட் ஓகே சிவசுந்தரன் थैंक यू நீங்க வந்து அதாவது வந்து நீங்க சரியா வந்து நீங்க வந்து டாக்டர்ஸ் அப்படி மாதிரி திங்க் பண்றீங்க லெட்ஸ் திங்க் லைக் எ சைக்காலஜிஸ்ட் ஓகே எஸ் சரியா லெட்ஸ் லெட்ஸ் ஜஸ்ட் திங்க் அபௌட் சைக்கோ எஜுகேஷன் ஃபைட் ஆஃப் ஃப்ளைட் அப்ப இப்ப நான் என்னுடைய பேஷண்ட் எப்படி இருந்தது பேஷண்ட் இப்படித்தானே கதைப்பாங்க சரியா நான் ஆக்ட் பண்ணினது பேஷண்டா எஸ் ஓகே சோ எக்ஸாக்ட்லி திஸ் இஸ் ஹவு பீப்புள் வில் கம் அண்ட் டெல் யூ லைக் வென் யூ ஆர் ஹேவிங் பேனிக் அட்டாக் தே வில் கம் அண்ட் டெல் யூ திஸ் ஓ டாக்டர் திஸ் இஸ் வாட்ஸ் ஹேப்னிங் நான் வந்து சாக போறேன் எனக்கு வந்து ஹார்ட் அட்டாக் வருது இப்ப கூட எனக்கு தலை சுத்துற மாதிரி இருக்கு அப்படின்னு தான் அவங்க சொல்லுவாங்க சோ தூ வில் பி திங்கிங் லைக் இஃப் யூ நோ தேர் ஆர் நோ அதர் திங்ஸ் ஆர் கோயிங் ஆன் சோ ஹவு டு பி ஆஃபர் சைக்கோ எஜுகேஷன் சோ பாவனா I'm going to pick up on you now. 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 Okay? Yeah? Go on then, Bhavana. Act like the patient. Okay. Um, from the beginning, I mean, from symptoms and all Just that. Just say uh, something. Like, I'm going to have a heart attack. Something like that. Then it's easier for me. I'm going to pick up on you now. So, I'm going to pick up on you now. I'm going to pick up on you now. I'm going to pick up on you now. சே انا பயமா இருக்கு நெஞ்சு கிளம்பு செய்து தலை சுத்து என்ன நடக்குதுன்னு தெரியல எனக்கு ஹார்ட் அட்டாக் வந்திருமோனு பயமா இருக்கு ஓகே ஓகே நாங்க பாப்போம் உங்களுக்கு ஹார்ட் அட்டாக் வரமோண்டு இதானால சரியா சோ நீங்க முதலாவது சொன்னது வந்து உங்களுக்கு வந்து ஹார்ட் அட்டாக் வர்ற மாதிரி இருக்குது நெஞ்சு படபடன்னு அடிக்குது ஹார்ட் அட்டாக்ண்டா என்ன என்ன 
ஓகே அப்ப நாங்க டிஸ்டிங்கிஷ் பண்ணிட்டோம் உங்களுக்கு ஹார்ட் அட்டாக்கா இல்லையா பல்பிடேஷன்ஸ் வந்து நல்லா வந்து அப்படின்னா உங்க ஹார்ட் நல்லா வேலை செய்யுதுன்னு அர்த்தம் இல்லையா ஓகே அப்ப நாங்க வந்து பார்ப்போம் ஹார்ட் அட்டாக் இஸ் வென் ஹார்ட் ஸ்டாப்ஸ் வென் பேனிக் அட்டாக் யுவர் ஹார்ட் வில் பி பம்பிங் லாட்ஸ் ஆஃப் பிளட் டு த பிளட் ஸ்ட்ரீம்ஸ் வேர் எஸ் ஹார்ட் அட்டாக் இட் டசன் ஹேப்பன் த ஹார்ட் ஸ்டாப்ஸ் ஒர்க்கிங் where as panic attack your heart is working really working trying to help you trying to support you so ungalku inda heart vandu udavi seiyudhu eppadi pada pada nda adikkiradhu enna nu sonna ungala blood vandu major muscles ku vandu send pannudhu adhu mudhalavudhu appo ungalku heart attack vandu illa nadakkilla adhu sariya naan solradhu vilangichu da no என்ன நினைக்கிறீங்க இதை பற்றி இப்ப நீங்க இது உங்களுக்கு இவ்வளவு காலமும் தெரியாதா ஹார்ட் அட்டாக்ல ஹார்ட் வந்து நிக்கும் பேனிக் அட்டாக் வந்து நடக்கேக்ல வந்து ஃபாஸ்ட் அடிக்கிறது அதெல்லாம் நல்லா தானே ஹார்ட் ஒர்க் பண்ணுது அது உங்களுக்கு தெரியாது முதல்ல அப்படியா தெரியாதான் பயமா இருக்குது இருக்குமோன்னு சொல்லி ஓகே ஏன் பே இருக்குதுன்னு பார்ப்போமா ரெண்டாவது சோ வேர்வை ஏன் நடக்குது எங்கட உடல் இல்லையன்னு சொன்னா அதிகமா வந்து எங்கட உடலுடைய சூடு நில ஏறின உடனே அந்த டெம்பரேச்சரை மெயின்டைன் பண்றதுக்காக எங்கட உடலில கூலிங் சிஸ்டம் இருக்குது அந்த கூலிங் சிஸ்டத்துல இருந்து என்ன நடக்கும் வியர்வை வரும் அப்ப வியர்வை வரைக்குள்ள எங்களோட டெம்பரேச்சர் வந்து ரெகுலேட் பண்ணப்படும் அப்படி என்று சொன்னா சாதாரண நிலைக்கு கொண்டு வரும் ஏன் எங்களோட பாடி வந்து ஹீட் ஆகுதுன்னு நினைக்கிறீங்க அதிக பிளட் வந்து உடலுக்கு வந்து பம்ப் பண்ணி மேஜர் மசில்ஸுக்கு போறபடியா குறைவான ஒரு பீரியட்ல எங்களோட உடலில இருக்கிற உடல்ல வந்து சூடு அதிகமாக வெளிப்படுகுது சரியா அதனால வந்து எங்களுக்கு வந்து கூலிங் சிஸ்டம் இட்ஸ் லைக் த ஏர் கண்டிஷன் சோ அதனால வியர்வை வருகுது இப்ப விளங்கிட்டுதா ஏன் உங்களுக்கு வியர்வை வருகுதுண்டு ஓகே சோ ரெண்டாவது மயக்கம் வர்ற மாதிரி மூன்றாவது மயக்கம் வர்ற மாதிரி என்று சொன்னீங்க பாப்போமா உங்களுக்கு எப்பாவது மயங்கி விழுந்திருக்கீங்களா இந்த பேனிக் அட்டாக் வரைக்குல இல்ல ஒரு நாளும் மயங்கி விழ இல்ல இல்லையா இல்ல ஓகே ஏன் என்று சொன்னா எப்பவுமே இது வந்த பேனிக் அட்டாக் வர்றது நீங்க ஆபத்துல இருக்கிறீங்க அப்படின்னு யோசி கேட்கல ஃபைட் ஓ பிளைட் சோ ஃபைட் ஓ பிளைட் எப்படி நடக்கும் அதாவது வந்து சோ நீங்க எக்ஸ்பிளைன் பண்ணலாம் நான் இப்ப உங்களுக்கு எக்ஸ்பிளைன் பண்ண போறோம் ஃபைட் ஆஃப் லைட் என்ன எங்களோட எங்களோட பிரெயின்ல ஒரு பகுதி வந்து அமிக் டாலா அப்படி என்று சொல்லுவாங்க அந்த பார்ட் வந்து எல்லா அனிமல்ஸ்லயும் மேமல்ஸ் எல்லாத்துலயும் இருக்கு அது எங்களோட சர்வைவல் நாங்க வந்து உயிர் வாழ்றதுக்காக இருக்கிற ஒரு பிரெயின் பார்ட் பட் இட் இஸ் பிரிமிட்டிவ் ஓல்டு அதாவது வந்து அது அந்த அதுன்ற ரெஸ்பான்ஸ் வந்து எங்களை பாதுகாத்து வச்சிருக்க வேணும் இப்ப வந்து அது பாதுகாப்பா இருக்கிறது அனிமல்ஸ்ல கூட இருக்கு அதே சேம் பிரெயின் பார்ட் தான் எங்களிடம் இருக்கு சோ திடீரென்று உங்களுக்கு முன்னால ஒரு ஸ்னேக் ஃபோல் பண்ணிச்சுது அப்படி என்று சொன்னா நீங்க என்ன செய்வீங்க திங்க் பண்ணுவீங்களா இருந்து அப்படி இந்த ஸ்னேக் அடிக்கிறது இல்ல உடனே தப்பி ஓடுவீங்க சரியா அப்ப அதுக்கு எந்த பாட்டு உங்களுக்கு உதவி செய்து இந்த அமிக் டாலா என்ற பாட் தான் உங்களுக்கு உதவி செய்யுது அப்படி நீங்க திடீரென்று திங்க் பண்ணாம எழும்பி எல்லாம் ஓடுறதுக்கு ஏன்னா அது வந்து மற்ற ரேஷனல் பிரெயின் பார்ட் அதாவது திங்க் பண்ற பிரெயின்ஸ் பார்ட்டோட இருந்து அதை டிஸ்கனெக்ட் பண்ணி உங்களை தப்பி ஓடுறதுக்காக உங்களை வந்து ஃபங்க்ஷன் பண்ண வைக்குது அது ட்ரிக்க பண்ணுது உங்களோட ஸ்ட்ரெஸ் ஹோமோன்கு அதாவது வந்து அட்ரலனின் அட்ரலனின் கோட்டெக்ஸ்க்கு வந்து அது சிக்னல்ஸ் கொடுக்குது அதுல இருந்து உங்களோட ஹோமோன்ஸ் ரிலீஸ் பண்ணுது அட்ரலின் ஹோமோன் இந்த பிளட் ஸ்ட்ரீம்ல என்ன இது கொடுப்பாங்க ஹார்ட் அட்டாக் வரைக்குள்ள என்ன ஷார்ட் கொடுப்பாங்க அட்ரலனின் ஷார்ட் கொடுப்பாங்க உங்களோட ஹார்ட்டை ரிவைவ் பண்றதுக்கு இது உங்களுக்கு ஆட்டோமேட்டிக்காகவே நடக்குது சோ உங்களுக்கு ஹார்ட் அட்டாக் நடக்கல இல்லையா ஏன்னு சொன்னா இப்ப ஹார்ட் அட்டாக் வந்தாலே அட்ரலனின் ஷார்ட் கொடுத்து அவங்க ரிவைவ் பண்ணுவாங்க ஹார்ட்டை வந்து இங்க வந்து அட்ரலனின் ஏற்கனவே உங்களுக்கு சுரக்கிறபடியா உங்களோட ஹார்ட் அதிகமா அடிச்சு உடலுக்கு அந்த இது வந்து போகுது அப்ப போறபடியா நீங்க வந்து என்னத்துக்காக உங்களை வந்து இது போக வைக்குது நீங்க ஓடுறதுக்கு நீங்க வந்து பயத்துல இருக்கிறீங்க தப்பி ஓடுறதுக்காக ஆனா நீங்க ஓட இல்ல நீங்க ஒரே இடத்துல இருக்கிறீங்க அதனால உங்களோட கால் வந்து ஷேக் பண்ணுது நீங்க ட்ரம்பிள் பண்ணும் உங்களோட கால் வந்து உங்களுக்கு வந்து பிளட் வந்து 
டைஜஸ்டிவ் சிஸ்டத்துக்கு போகாத படியா அது வந்து உங்களுக்கு வந்து நோசியா மாதிரி இருக்கும் பட்டர்ஃபிளைஸ் வர்ற மாதிரி இருக்கும் டம்மில ஏனென்று சொன்னா நீங்க ஓடி ஏதாவது ஒரு டேஞ்சருக்குள்ள தப்பேக்குள்ள உங்களுக்கு டைஜஸ்டிவ் சிஸ்டத்துக்கு பிளட் தேவையோ இல்ல ஏன்னா இந்த பாடி ஏற்கனவே டிசைட் பண்ணி கட் பண்ணும் தேவையில்லாத பார்ட்ஸுக்கு பிளட் தேவையில்லை தேவையான பாட்டுக்கு போகட்டும்னு சொல்லி தோட்ஸ் வந்து ரேசிங்கா இருக்கும் குயிக்கா திங்க் பண்ணும் ஏன்னு சொன்னா இங்க ஃபாஸ்டா வந்து ஓடுறதுக்காக ரேபிட் டிசிஷன் மேக் பண்ணி அப்ப அதனால என்ன நடக்குதுன்னு தெரியாது ட்ரை மவுத்தா இருக்கும் ஏன்னு சொன்னா டைஜஸ்டிவ் சிஸ்டம் வந்து மவுத் வந்து டைஜஸ்டிவ் சிஸ்டத்தின் ஒரு பார்ட் அப்ப டைஜஷன் ஷட் டவுன் பண்ணிக்கல என்ன நடக்கும் டேஞ்சரஸ் சுச்சுவேஷன்ல அந்த ஓல் த எனர்ஜி இஸ் டுவர்ட்ஸ் மேஜர் மசல்ஸ் சரியா சோ அந்த பிளட் சர்க்குலேஷன்ஸ் எல்லாம் குறைவா இருக்கும் ஹார்ட் ஹார்ட் வந்து ஃபாஸ்டா பீட்ஸ் பண்ணும் அப்ப பாம் வந்து ஸ்வெட்டி அது கொஞ்சம் நான் எக்ஸ்பிளைன் பண்ணேன் ஸ்வெட்டி அண்ட் பிரீதிங் குயிக் ஷலோவரா வரும் சோ இதே எல்லாத்தையும் வந்து யூ ஆர் எக்ஸ்பிளனே எக்ஸ்பிளனேஷன் கொடுக்கறது தான் சைக்கோ எஜுகேஷன் சோ சிவசந்திரன் கிவ் மீ யுவர் தாட் நீங்க என்ன நினைக்கிறீங்க இந்த சிம்பிளா தான் கொடுக்கணும் அதாவது வந்து நீங்க கூட நிறைய திங்க் பண்றீங்க லைக் அ டாக்டர் திங்க் பண்ற மாதிரி அப்படி நீங்க கொடுத்தீங்கன்னு சொன்னா நிறைய டைம் போகும் சிம்பிளா அவங்களுக்கு நீங்க சொன்னீங்கன்னு சொன்னா அவங்களோட மனதுல பதியும் இது நீங்க என்ன யோசிக்கிறீங்க நீங்க சொன்னதுல பிள்ளை இல்ல பட் உங்களோட வந்து டீடைல் என்னுடைய வந்து வெரி சிம்பிள் வாட் டு யூ திங்க் தட் இஸ் பெட்டர் बिकॉज இந்த பேஷியன்ட் நாங்க நாங்க ஜோசிக்க முடியாது அவங்களுக்கு எங்கட சேம் லெவல் ஆஃப் லிட்டரசி ஓ இன்டர்பிரிட்டேஷன் இருக்கும்னு நாங்க சொல்ல முடியாது சோ அவங்களுக்கு கொஞ்சம் டேப் டவுன் பண்ணி லைக் பேசிக் பட் எதா பட் ஒரு சென்ஸ் மேக் பண்ண கூடிய இத வந்து கொடுத்தா அந்த உடனே நாங்க ட்ரீட்மென்ட் இனிஷியேட் பண்ணலாம் very good that's how you have to think it has to be very simple udaniye distinguish pannonum ninga heart attack ah panic attack ah very quick to distinguish is this heart attack heart doesn't work panic attack your heart is working really good well done your heart is working so you don't have to be scared so if if you are thinking you are having a heart attack listen to your heart it goes bum 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 it's working good so அப்படி நீங்க வந்து கொடுக்கல அவங்களோட ஞாபகம் வந்து கூடுதலா இருக்கும் சோ நெக்ஸ்ட் டைம் அவங்களுக்கு பனிக் அட்டாக் வரைக்கலாம் ஹார்ட் அட்டாக் அண்ட் யோசிச்சாலும் கொஞ்சம் நேரம் திங்க் பண்ணி ஹார்ட் வேலை செய்து தானே சத்தம் கேட்குது பிளட் ஃபுளோ பண்ணுது அண்ட் கொஞ்சம் ரேஷனலைஸ் பண்ண வலிக்கிட்டுடுவாங்க சரியா ஏன் ஸ்வெட்டிங் வருது அண்ட் எக்ஸ்பிளைன் எக்ஸ்பிளனேஷன் கொடுக்கல அந்த சிம்டம்ஸுக்கு ஏற்ற நீங்க சைக்கோ எஜுகேஷன் கொடுத்தீங்கன்னா சரி அவங்களுக்கு விளங்கி கொள்ற மாதிரி ஓகே so that's good so that is a simple psycho education and then we are moving on to behavioral approaches for panic so enna nanga behavioral approaches who talks about it balo 1998 and then clark's model actually clark is the one who trained me so you, you know you are looking at someone who are trained by him the one who actually wrote the panic you know who who developed the panic model and also uh, i'm be- i'm working with him as well so um i should be able to tell a little bit more about the cognitive model because he's the one who developed that for panic but unfortunately that's another time maybe in the future where we can uh, you know maybe work together so nangal ipo behavioral approaches as the paapo ana clark inda konjam nan kondu varren we i'm bringing him a little bit in here just to ensure that the behavioral intervention is kind of um, you know have, to, to have an understanding actually but we are going to focus on the behavioral intervention especially habituation and the mechanism of change apri anxiety how the anxiety is reducing as a result of that okay so let's look at it this is a uh, clark's panic model trigger on the internal alert the external so it could be internal trigger where they are, they have a trigger of panic um and that could be the sensations that they notice and the threat is perceived they feel like oh gosh there is you know something bad is going to happen something dangerous is going to happen anxiety kicks in and then body symptoms and uh, mental uh, kind of symptoms are happening taking place the emotional anxiety kicks in and they are experiencing all the bodily related to sim- bodily related symptoms what they are doing is the second they are engaging in safety seeking behaviors which is avoidance or there are some people they kind of uh, do this they kind of take their pulse they feel the pulse here uh, and they put their hands here and just to see whether the heart is beating and things like that and catastrophic misinterpretation i'm having a panic attack i'm going to faint because tala vandu disi maadri irukekla 
they can faint. Can they faint in panic attack? Can people faint because of panic attack? So no, because the arousal is high, isn't it? Arousal is high and they are kind of, they need to run away from danger. So it's not possible to faint at that time, but the derealization happens, the freeze response happens to some people. So remember that, that's also not fully fainting or anything. However, with blood phobia, they do faint. So there was only one thing <laughs> that people faint is that needle blood phobia is what you need to watch out for. Apart from that, so if they don't have other things, they don't faint. So we will move on from this. And uh, what we are doing is graded exposure in six steps following psychoeducation about panic disorder, the panic cycle, fight or flight response, uh, and the steps implementing graded exposure. Psychoeducation about graded exposure. So there are four principles. Construct graded exposure. Numbers, umulaku example thandanan. Aladu vandu bus stop ko poradu. Mudal adu mudal avdu. Renda avdu vandu bus varekla nikradu. Munda avdu erradu busikla. Maybe nikkekla ko daari paakalam. Actually, travel stop. So, anything you are doing is a graded response. So, OCD learning and checking, you can do that like that as well. So, what you are doing is you are grading an exposure hierarchy. Get uh, set smart goals for the first step on the hierarchy and plan out how to implement exposure for homework. So smart goals, always make sure that it is achievable, whatever you are doing. Implement exposure tasks, review the exposure task using the graded exposure principles. Repeat from stage three, if next step in hierarchy is appropriate. So you have a hierarchy of level, bus, train, lift, something, you know, or flying, something like that. So when you have all these things in hierarchy, you go, you take, tackle the bus, one, two, three, four, tackle the train, one, two, three, four, like, you know, you keep repeating that. So you have a hierarchy of feared situation, then you are hierarchy of how you are going to tackle that, and then you are going to repeat that again for different, different situation. Does that make sense? Okay. Application of exposure. Exposure can be used for external situation and you can use it for internal as well. So let's look at it, increased heart rate, trembling and everything. Those people who are with, um, you can induce panic. So you will have to induce them, bring panic up. So you have to make them panic. So what are the things that will cause panic? You might say panic attack, heart attack, fainting, dizziness, that itself will, so paired words, you could work, Ningavanda or words are early the Tamil Lili or Nathalio, in a heart attack and a Tamil Lina, maybe Ninga heart attack and a solella, Nan Mindy will have foreign, in a heart attack, a pretty thing of Vasi Chale or a panic verum. Ningavanda test panic parang, the Vasi Chale, wouldn't they feel like I'm, I'm panicky, my heart rate is a thing, I'm going to die, I'm going to. Fall apart, I'm going to faint. Okay, let's wait and see if it happens. Okay. So, so when you start, they would say the anxiety is zero to 10. 10, 100 percentage, I'm having a panic attack now. And so let's stay, let's stay, let's stay. Stay so three, four, three, four, so something like that. So that is exposure. So ninga induce pannu Jump panna chellala. Meenda jump pannu ve maatina. Meenda ninge parapparan dalikim jump pannina. Meenda blood vandu fast up home. So simple things like jump or get them to exercise and they say they are going to fall apart and they wouldn't go for walk and things like that, these people. They will stay indoors. And so walk pannina, tangalaka heart attack on the map and the sat and the ninji padapada and adi kradala matram kuda focus of a chirkrapadia pay and the divinam. A penning induce pandalam ninga walk panango papa mugalka heart attack where the one soli jump panango kun yam run pani parango five minutes. So you put on experiments ninga ninga irikrada tele sayala. So experiments ninga on the same the poho and diver. So it is important to select stimuli that are most relevant to the patient, situation, objects that are avoided, and elicited anxiety. So the heart attacks, fainting, So either disease, 
பண்ண வைக்கும் சோ யூ பிரிங் பேனிக் யூ மேக் தேம் சி தட் இட் தே கேன் காம் டவுன் அண்ட் தென் இட் டிஸ்அபியர்ஸ் समथिंग லைக் தட் சோ தட் தட் கேன் பீ டன் இன் தி செஷன் இட்செல்ஃப் டு ஸ்டார்ட் வித் ஓகே சூப்பர் இட்ஸ் அப்ளிகேஷன் இட்ஸ் தட் habituation extinction model so we are looking at the habituation again these are the two processes that are cited as an explanation for the effects of exposure habituation is to decline in fear responses particularly physiological responses over repeated exposures to a fear provoking stimuli so if you are scared of spider bring the spider in they are having panic attack so all right i'm keeping the spider here let's see how long <laughs> and then you know let let's see how long your panic comes down it comes down but that's flooding you don't do that flooding is more like it's not kind of uh, fear hierarchy where you are doing it carefully so flooding is like you just present the stimuli in front of them so we are not doing that here we are doing the habituation one so that means if people are fear of spider just another example first you might want to show them the picture of the spider then the video of the spider then you might want to kind of you know make them see a spider from a long distance then bring them something like that so you, so that's what we are doing but it has to be prolonged enough so the fear actually goes away so extinction is actually anxiety reduction results from repeated encounters with anxiety provoking situation without aversive consequences minimal anxiety response aversion is gone anxiety is gone they are no longer kind of having that so that's completely kind of stopping from having anxiety so example one let's say learning to be afraid uh, of something bob is involved in car crash he feels frightened at that time memory is created in the mind which links to car cars feeling feeling afraid the problem of fear reminders of car crash activate bob's fear memory and make him feel afraid his fear means that he avoids traveling in cars or on the road this avoidance that he doesn't get into learn to safe so he doesn't get to learn how safe traveling by car normally is after the accident it's not safe to travel in car that's the memory that's there so exposure therapy as part of his treatment bob is gradually exposed to cars in variety of different situation nothing bad happens he begins to feel safe around cars and he start drives again he is driving again okay so anxiety is reduced exposure doesn't make the fear of memory go away it just create new safe memories it potentially in potential scary situation the old memory and the new safe memory compete whenever a reminder comes along bob can be reminded of either the old fear memory or the new safe memory the more exposure theory he has done therapy he has done uh, the more positive memories he will have to rely on and more capable he will feel so the more exposure therapy they are doing is the way to extinct the fear in this way that's an example of how we can work with these things so that is important so i'll give you an other one let's say dog how the fear is learned fear accusation dog barking random go together so the dog means threat exposure therapy we expose them to dogs but a friendly dog so met a dog who didn't bark at me it even licked my hand and wanted to wanted me to play so dog doesn't mean threat so there was a second learning is taking place now later on encounter a dog memory retrieval competition it is competing isn't it one is the old memory is competing dog is actually a dangerous thing the new safe memory is saying dog is not actually a, a, a dangerous Uh, thing so there was a competing happening in terms of memory but if you want to increase the calm new safe uh, meaning needs to win so if it needs to win you need to do more exposure to that friendly dog where that this memory wins does that make sense so there was a competition isn't it old memory is a threat memory 
this new memory we are kind of doing is a safe memory. So whenever the safe memory is winning over and over again, the, if the new safe meaning wins the retrieval competition, there's a competition going on. And if this wins over and over again, then obviously that person is going to feel safe with the dog. If that's going to happen, you do need to do prolonged exposure. So you need to keep repeated and prolonged. That is important. Okay, so how this looks like is anxiety is rapidly increasing, motivates and urge to escape. People, the, the person doesn't like the dog, you bring the dog in front of them, of course he's going to escape. He's not going to look and smile at the dog. So they don't like it when they start it. So we need to ex explain to them using this. Look, when we are going to do this exposure work, your anxiety will go up, maybe sky high, but it comes back down and it keeps coming back down in the long period of time. However, if you avoid the situation completely, the anxiety comes down slightly, but it remains and it never comes down fully. Do you understand with the safety seeking behavior, the anxiety remains high. Whereas with the exposure, the anxiety goes really up, but it comes down after a long period of time. So what happens, a common, uh, mistaken expectation is anxiety will continue to increase catastrophic, catastrophically, which is not true. So what happens? Exposure to the fear object or situation can result in habituation and reduction in fear. And fear often reduces faster and quicker with repeated exposures. So the repetition is important until the completely the fear is gone. So then they are no longer having that fear. How, so I'm going to ask now, it's time for questions. So tell me, how, how, how is it? Does it make sense? How, does this make sense? I know we, we are slightly over. Sivasundran? Oh, yes, it makes sense. Okay. Any other comments, Chalavirum Bringla? Any other cognitive behavioral behavioral behavior? So anyone want to share anything? Bhavana, any comments from what you have heard? What, what do you think that you would take away from, from this session maybe? Um, the important thing is to uh, you know, psychoeducate the patient about and reassure them that what they're feeling is not um, in that case a heart attack or anything like that. So it's that part is really important so that mm -hmm. in future they can rationalize and you know, uh, make sense of what's happening to them. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, then this part about the greater exposure and habituation and all that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so that, is, that is what we can do. But again, you are applying this to anything. Panic can be presented in any, any, play, any disorders, isn't it? But I say if it is panic disorder, agoraphobia is getting them out, get, taking to the shops and make them go out and do the shopping, things like that. So that is a very simple way of doing it. Do you have a fear? If you are fearing, can you expose yourself to that? And that would be your homework, finding out what you are fearing and what about doing some exposure? It could be spiders. It could be something that you might want to do and see what happens with the uh, repeated exposure. Shall we say that's your homework practice? Um, in Nero, sorry, I forgot her name. Bhavana, do you remember um, 2018 FM 084? Maybe you have a colleague here. Yeah, ma'am. Thanks, Mishra. Sorry? Hello? Uh, so, Lunga? Oh, Nishra, Nishra. Nisha? Nishra. Oh, Nishra. Okay. Oh, so, okay. So, yes, yes. do you want to say anything about this? Do, do you have an understanding of, do you feel that this is understandable? Is that okay? Uh, yeah, ma'am. Okay. Some sort of uh, problem, that's why. 
Okay. No, that's fine. That's fine. As long as you have an understanding, if you don't have any questions, that's fine. Okay. So cognitive uh, therapy is slightly different, um, but we only talked about exposure because it's easier. Uh, that's the only reason. I'll be very happy to, if you are interested, I will be very happy to think about this in the future, but with only very, very few people, because I don't think this is for everyone. You, you can see that, that the reduction uh, of people coming in and, and not attending. So shall we stop here? Um, I know I went through this very, very quickly. It's a bit unfair um, because it's all, it, it is almost like an all day teaching. Um, so, but I thought I could be able to even give you a little bit about that. Next week, I have planned psychosis for you because I thought we are talking about anxiety and depressive disorders. Uh, but at the same time, maybe it might be a good idea that you could kind of have an understanding or distinguish this from that. Um, and even uh, when people had had a psychotic episode, if they could have anxiety disorders and things like that, and still CBT can be used to work with people who are not going through a psychotic breakdown, but it's all um, so that they are using medication, it's stabilized, but can use uh, CBT as well. Similarly, like what, what, what we have been doing, like behavioral approach and cognitive approach. So next week, that's that that's what is going to happen. I hope there would be more people uh, to encourage the person. So um, let's see. Okay. Sure. Okay. Thank you, Sambhavi. Thank you, everybody. Have a lovely weekend. And thank you, Bhavana, Nishura, and Shiva uh, for your input. And it really helps when you ask questions and share things. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.